Well, why don't you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and then hold your finger there and go back to the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 6. Luke chapter 10 and then 2 Kings chapter 6. So I'll give you just a moment to find your way and uh, put your finger in, or put something in the, there that you can refer to that later on in the message. I just pulled into this salvage recycling yard. I've driven by it hundreds of times. This time I pulled in and I was so amazed at the, the huge piles of scrap metal. People have brought things here that maybe have lost their value. They no longer serve a purpose. Maybe they're just taking up space and they want to get rid of it. And I began to think about how relationships can be the same way. They start off so beautiful with so much purpose, but somewhere along the way, they end up here on a, on a scrap heap. Well, there's no doubt that the owner of this scrap yard, um, when they see truck after truck after truck hauling their trash here, their, their metal here, believe me, he gets excited because he still sees the value of this scrap metal. You know, that's like our Heavenly Father, our Creator God. He has never lost sight of your value. Now, you may be in a relationship right now that if you look at it on the surface, it looks like it's headed for the scrap heap. Well, I want you to know that God still sees value in you. He still sees value in your relationships. And so for the next couple of weeks, that's what I want to talk about. Establishing some good habits, relational habits, that can help you regardless of what relationship it is. Maybe it's in a marriage. Maybe it's with a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a mom, or a dad. God can help you to take what is headed for the trash heap and turn it into a treasure. I really hope you tune in. God bless you. I want to talk a little bit for the next uh, couple of weeks about love at last sight. Now, somehow we'll get that all uh, squared away here. Love at last sight. I, I, you know, you've heard love at first sight. Now, I'm not a big fan of that whole idea of love at first sight. Now, that might be your story, and I don't mean to minimize that. Uh, that wasn't our case, our story. We uh, knew, knew each other for like four or five years before God put us together. We went to the same Bible school. We had some mutual friends, hung out once in a while, but... There was no infatuation or attraction at that point, but uh, the Lord's timing is perfect, and he finally opened up my eyes to her beauty and how wonderful a person she was, and so I was hooked right away. But uh, I think it's more fitting to look at love as love at last sight, so that there's more that you, when, at the end, you end up with more than you did at the beginning, because uh, it, it takes a lot in a relationship to keep it moving forward, to keep it healthy, to keep it growing strong. And I don't want to start off with a, a bunch and then end with a little. I want to end with more than what I started with. It's like if I had a handful of sand. We started over here with Jason and Rachel, and, and we passed this handful of sand all the way back here, through here, all the way, ended up over here by, by Sam. You know, how much uh, sand are we going to have left? Probably not very much. And oftentimes that's what happens in relationships. We start off with so much and we end up with so little. I love the idea of love at last sight. But to get there, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of creativity, a lot of vision, a lot of time, uh, building trust so that there's a commitment there when maybe there's been breaches of trust and the challenges that go in relationship. Uh, it, it takes a lot to get there. I've often believed that great relationships are really a creation. Great relationships don't just pop out of the sky. It's not that you just got lucky or he got lucky or she got lucky finding this person. Uh, I believe it's more than that. Uh, you, you know, out of all the billions of fish in the sea, you found that one. I mean, it makes for great uh, movies, Hallmark movies and romantic novels or whatever, but reality, it takes a lot of work. I believe that great relationships really are a creation. Uh, probably the greatest challenge in maybe marriage uh, and relationships in general is the fact that it's not really about finding the right one. It's really about learning to love the one that you found. It's not about finding your soulmate. It's, it's learning to love the soul of your mate. And when you are committed to this bottom part, learning to love the one that you found, if you're focused there, it means your search for finding the one is over. Honey, I'm not searching anymore. You are the one. 
And I'm learning to love you. I'm learning to love your, the soul of who God made you to be. My search is over. I'm not searching across the room in the coffee shop. I'm not searching for someone in an oncoming car. The grass is not greener on the other side. I'm committed to loving the soul of the one that God put into my life. And it takes work. It's, it's really not just something that happens automatic. It is a, a creation. It's something that we work at. And really, there's nothing uh, like being in healthy relationships, whether it's with your heavenly father or whether it's with the people that you care most about. To, to be in a healthy relationship, to be so connected, there's nothing like it. To be fully known and yet fully loved. Fully known, not just the, the highlight reels, not just you know the, the mask version of Mike or Connie or, or you, but the worst version of yourself to be fully known and yet fully loved. Does it get any better than that? To experience that kind of relationship and that kind of connection. I mean, after all, really, uh, when we look at friendships, this message isn't just about marriages or romantic relationships. This, this message is going to help any relationship you have. Uh, but, and, and when you look at friendship, what is, you know, how do you find good friendships? What, what defines uh, friendship? What is a real true friend? I mean, you can have a thousand Facebook friends and not have one person in your life that, you know, would really come when you need them, when you're at your best or maybe when you're at your worst. You can have hundreds of emails that you respond to every week because there's a demand on you. They need information. But you can lack having somebody you know, reach out to you without strings attached. I mean, how, how do we deepen relationships that we have? How do we make them better than they are? Because when you come to the end, I mean, I mean the end end. Now, as believers, it's really never, even death is not an end for us. It's just the beginning of eternity. But this life here on earth, when we come to the end end, it really comes down to probably the most important thing is relationships. I've often said, and I've, I've heard it said before, it's not original with me, that you make the biggest investment in the people who are standing at your casket. That's, that's where you want to make your biggest investment and, and we have many decisions we make every day, every week, every year of our life, who we really make our investment. Some people are so committed to work and to that company, they're so loyal. And oftentimes, you, you've heard this story that they're not as loyal to you at the end. They'll give you a pink slip and choose somebody younger, and uh, you just kind of end up on the shelf there's not much loyalty that comes back to that big investment you make all your life. Or maybe you've invested yourself in a business and that's good because you want to provide. You want to be able to be blessed so you can be a blessing. I'm not discounting that at all. But sometimes we make all those investments and there is a high price. There's a high cost. And oftentimes relationships uh, get pushed to the side and don't receive the priority or the focus that they need to. We find so many things that divide us as people in our relationships. Uh, we're just so polarized. Uh, politics can polarize us, even in a family. Religion can polarize us. Maybe you, your whole family were Catholic or, or Lutheran or whatever denomination, and you make a break, and all of a sudden you're excommunicated. There's a big division. Even good things, you can be polarized over good things, things of faith, things of, you know, people, will, it's all about supernatural signs and wonders, and yet I've seen what, what God intended to be a bridge to bring people to greater faith becomes a wall, and all of a sudden families are fractured and split over things that even are good. And so there's so many things that want to keep us from being connected and, and keep us from experiencing those deeper and richer relationships, and so that's why I wanted to just do this two-week mini-series on relationships. And I want to suggest a, a number of good relational habits that will help any relationship. Again, I'm not talking just about marriage. I'm talking about maybe a relationship with a son, with a daughter, with a, with a brother or sister, maybe a mom or a dad. Uh, where, you know, there's some strain, there's been some issues, there's been some challenges. What can you do to make it better. There are four, and there's more than four, uh, but I'm going to do two this week and two next week. There's many more, but I'm just, I'm going to give us a place to start. And if you are, if you would commit yourself to doing all four, to do one of these four, even maybe the first one we're going to talk about today, I guarantee you will see an impact 
in that relationship regardless of the condition of it. And you'll find yourself able to grow closer to them and they to you as well. So there's four uh, good relational habits that I want to talk about. We'll do two this week again and then two next week. The first one is this, is number one, be all there. Be all there. In your relationship or relationships in general, be all there. I cannot overestimate the importance and the impact of this one thing here, being all all there. Maybe I feel it so much because I've had to work on that one so much. Oh, you know, I, I, you know, we're all into multitasking. You can't go through life without multitasking. You're doing two or three things at once. To get it all done, you, you really have to. I mean, some people multitask in many different ways. Uh, uh, they'll text while they drive. I won't uh, ask for a raise, showing the hands on that one. You might get in trouble. Um, you know, putting on makeup when you drive. I've never had that problem, thank God. Uh, you know, you've seen people who just, they're oblivious to things, or they're walking down the sidewalk and they're in their phone and they, they don't know, you know, bumping into people. I mean, people multitask. And, you know, it's good because, at, at some points, it's good because, you know, uh, it's helpful, it's beneficial. When you're working out, to put the earbuds in. You can listen to a podcast. You can listen to worship music. You can watch the news and get caught up with the news. I mean, that's very productive. Uh, so sometimes multitasking is good, but the problem is multitasking does not work in relationships. It doesn't. It takes away from the focus that is needed. In Now, some of you, I are, I are, well, I think I can do it. I think I can do it. Well, I'm telling you, you're wrong. You can't. God didn't create us that way. He didn't wire us that way. Um, and we, we, we think we can, but, but we can't. Now, this habit of being all there, uh, I mean, in, in our home situation, our family life, I mean, I, there's been many, 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 many times that I've been there physically, but I have not been there emotionally. <laughs> I've been there in body, but I'm w w way far away in spirit. I think you can relate to me. We've all, you know, kind of zoned out at certain times. I've been notorious in our family for um, asking a question to something that's already been answered maybe seconds ago. <laughs> Because I haven't been engaged in the conversation. I've been thinking about a, a game, a score. I've been thinking about something at work, something that's stressing me out. Just not involved in the conversation. And I'll oftentimes ask a question that it's already been answered. And they'll be like, oh, that's just dad. And so that's a real bad habit. I've really been working hard at learning to be all there. And to be able to put some things aside. And to be able to focus uh, in, in the relationship. So something that I'm trying to turn from a bad habit into a good habit is wherever you are, be all there. Wherever you are, whoever you are with, make this a habit, a decision that you are going to choose to be all there. Maybe you've seen, you know, kids that'll take their parents by the head and they'll turn their head and say, Dad, look at me. Mom, look at me. You know, we're so busy and, and oftentimes it's busyness around the kids that we forget to stop and parent or we forget to stop and, and be all there and they have to turn our head. Would you please listen to me? Maybe you've seen that YouTube sensation, that little boy who says, listen, Linda, listen, 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 Linda. You know, sometimes our kids have to just be right out there to, to grab our attention. But wherever you are, make that commitment now that you will be all there. And that's why this is good for any relationship. If you would do this one thing, I mean, there may be five things you need to do, but you do this one thing, you will see an immediate impact in your relationship. You will surprise some people. They'll be like, who are you? You know, where'd you come from? Wow, you're just... Because people don't care how much you know. You may have a lot to say, but they don't care how much you know, and you've heard this before, until they know how much you care. And one way to really care is to simply be all there. Now, the Bible has a great story, Luke chapter 10, uh, that, that 
illustrates this so wonderfully. And Jesus is such a master teacher, and, and he hits it right on the head in this whole area. Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus and his disciples, they continue on their way to Jerusalem, and they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, this probably wasn't the first time that Jesus came to their home. They were family friends, Mary, uh, Martha and Mary, who's another character, and Lazarus was their brother. Remember that story? Uh, Lazarus is sick, and they send word to try to get Jesus to come to heal their friend, uh, and Jesus doesn't show up. He delays, he delays until Lazarus dies. And they're like, when Jesus finally shows up, they're like... Master, if you had been here, you know, he, he wouldn't have died. And, but Jesus knew ahead of time he was going to raise the brother up from the dead anyways. So it wasn't an issue to Jesus. But here, you know, so the, I'm just saying they knew each other. This wasn't the first time maybe that Jesus was at her, uh, their home. But, you know, she still welcomes him. And uh, can you imagine if Jesus came to your home? What kind of preparations you would make? Uh, you'd sure, you'd make sure it's picked up. You would probably have a good meal that you're thinking or you're preparing for, getting all ready, because, man, you know, the VIP is coming, and, and let's, let's make sure he has a good experience. Well, that was the case for Martha. So uh, her sister Mary, another character in this story, she's sitting at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. Now, this irritated Martha, because Martha, she is a doer. And she could not stand that her sister Mary was just sitting there doing nothing. And so she points that out. It, it says Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was repairing, preparing. So she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you? And part of me wants to defend Martha, doesn't it you? I mean, think about it. A VIP Jesus is coming to your house, of course you're going to make things right. You're going to busy yourself. I mean, come on, kids. They're 15 minutes and counting. Just put it under the bed. I don't care. Put it in the closet. we got to get this place right. And, and so part of me wants to defend Martha. You know, she's just, she wants to please the master. And uh, so, you know, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her, Jesus. Come on now, Jesus. Tell her to come and help me. Well, Jesus responds to Martha and says, but listen, my dear Martha, 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 you are so worried and upset over all these details. <laughs> Can you relate to that? Have you ever been so obsessed over the details that you miss out on maybe some of the important things? There's times I'll say to Connie, after we have guests and there's a, you know, the dish. It's, it's full of dishes and a mess, and she'll, be, she'll go right away and start cleaning up because she wants to get all that done. I'm like, Honey, come on, leave that till later. I'll help you, maybe. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you later. <laughs> she knows better, right? <laughs> I'll help you. Just come, come, come in here. We're talking about some good stuff. You're going to miss it. And, you know, because some people, that's, they're like Martha. They're, they're doers, doers, doers. They got to get it done before they can ah, relax. And there's a place and a purpose for that. But, you know, Jesus points it out. You're so worried and upset over the details. You know, how easy is that to do, uh, to, to, to be that, to, to get upset and get worried? And, and we just want to control certain situations. How about the holidays? You've got, maybe you've got multiple families coming. It's kind of a complex family story, but you got, you know, well, the one family's coming here, and, and we, they got to fit into this time slot, and it's Christmas Day, right, so you got a lot to do this time slot, and then we'll have this family come over here, and we can't have them overlap, because you know what happened last time it overlapped, it just wasn't a good scene, or, you know, you're going to sit here around the table, you're going to sit here, make sure we don't talk about that specific issue, because we bring that up, you know what happened last time, so we're trying to control all the details and control outcomes, you know what a train wreck that can be because it never ends up the way you would think it should go. And so it's so easy to find ourselves being so worried and so upset and uptight over some of the details. And Jesus, he's so good. He's so smart. He's so wise. He said the most important thing is this. There is only one thing worth being concerned about, Martha, and Mary has discovered it. And don't you dare make her feel guilty over it. And it will not be taken away from her. Don't guilt her to get up and try to help you. She has discovered the most important thing. You're busy with all this stuff. 
But there's something that is more important. And that's Mary has found it. Mary is enjoying time with Jesus while Mary, Martha is just finding herself busy and busy and busy and busy. Now, I want to ask some probing questions this morning related to this story. You might want to get your phone so you can take some screenshots at these questions because these are great, usable questions for you in some of the conversations you can have today and this week. You might want to take out a pen and jot down some of these questions. But I want you to put yourself in the mix here for a moment. I'm not going to get answers from the crowd, but answer privately to yourself. The first one is this. Do you relate more to Mary or to Martha? All right, we lost it. Maybe we'll get it back. Oh, there we go. All right, how about that? <laughs> so who do you relate to more? To Mary or to Martha? Are you kind of the one who, you know, you're just more relaxed and you're just kind of, you know, what comes, what may, what's that? Um, que sera, que sera, sera. Okay, yeah. So you just, or are you the one that, man, you got you to gotta have everything done, details and in control. So who do you relate to? Now, it's good for you to maybe self-assess, but I'm going to tell you, you're probably not as accurate about yourself as those around you. So a better question is, what would others say? What would your spouse say? What would your husband say? What would your teenager say? Mom, I just can't get any time with you. You're so busy, and I know a lot of the stuff is busy around us because you're taking us here and taking us there, but I don't know when the last time we've had a face-to-face. -face. I, I feel like, Mom, I, even though I'm a teenager, I need to take your head and turn it this way. Mom, would you look at me? So what would somebody else say? You know, who are, who, you, who are you more like? And now here's a spot where you want to get defensive, especially if they say, well, you know, I feel this. This is my perception. This is where you're going to want to be defensive. And put up your wall and say, well, this is why I'm doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me give you the best answer, the best response you could ever have in that situation. And that's this. The only thing you should say is, thank you for caring enough to share. And I promise to weigh it carefully. That is a piece of gold. If it's the only thing you get out of this uh, meet, uh, teaching here today, is that phrase right there. Because I know you want to defend, I know you want to come up with your excuses and your rationale, but oftentimes that will shut the conversation down in a hurry. Best thing to say is thank you for caring enough to share. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I promise to weigh it carefully. So let me ask you another question then. How would you have responded to Jesus when Jesus, you know, called Martha out on that issue of being too busy, you know, how would you have responded to Jesus in that situation? Would you have said, seriously, Jesus? Really? You mean sitting down, doing nothing is better than doing what's needed and what's required? Jesus, are you serious? Really? Would you respond that way or would you uh, be offended? Go tuck your tail between your legs and run and hide and feel underappreciated. Nobody, nobody, you know, everybody takes me for granted. I got to do all the work around here, like Martha said. And, and so you just going to, everybody's going to have to walk around eggshell, on eggshells around you now for the rest of the day. Hey, where'd dad go? Oh, he's, he's out in the garage. Let him give him time to cool off. He took a walk, whatever. You know, how would you respond to that? Or, or would you be like, oh, finally, I'm relieved. Somebody finally is giving me permission to stop. And to sit down and relax and stop controlling every situation. Some good questions. I guarantee if you look at this, here, here's a good idea for a devotion time, a devos with your family. Right here. This, read this story that we just read. And I'm giving you all the points here now. So you're like, you could be like, wow, dad, you're so smart. You're such a Bible scholar, right? No. So read that story and then ask these questions as a family. I'm telling you, you will hear some things that will might be, ouch, but it could be some real growth points in your relationship because sometimes we just see through our own tunnel vision. We've got blind spots. We don't see what others see, and they may be seeing something totally different that would be so helpful so that you don't repeat what you've already been doing. That's a definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Here's some opportunity for you to grow in your relationship. It's not easy. These, these things are simple, but they're not easy. Okay? But I'm telling you, 
What's going to happen? You do that. You do that tonight for a family meeting or maybe sometime this week where you have a family dinner, you're going to have a family meeting. If that's ever possible these days, I hope you're beginning to train your children small when you can, when you can really have that leverage and do that. I guarantee you, they'll come to you later and say, hey, can, can, uh, can, can we do that thing again? Well, what thing? That thing where we sit around and talk? Yeah. They'll be asking you to do that because of just the opportunity to, to grow and take that relationship further than it's ever been before. So here's some other questions that kind of uh, probe even further. And this is an opportunity for you, mom and dad, to talk a little bit about your past. Did you grow up in a home with parents who are all there? Did you grow up in a home with parents who were all there? Okay, you might have to talk a little bit about your experience of growing up. And let me say this, your past is not an excuse as to why you are the way you are, but it does offer an explanation. It's not an excuse. Well, that's just the way I am. Take it or leave it. You married me for better or worse. I guess this is worse. You know, too bad. No, it's not an excuse, but it does offer an explanation as to why you handle relationships the way you do, the why you function the way you do. Okay? But did you grow up in a home with parents who were all there? And if not, which maybe many of you would say, yeah, that's, that's true, what do you think kept them from being all there? What was it? Probably some good things. Maybe work. I mean, that's a good thing, but maybe sometimes that balance scale tips maybe too much. Maybe it was an addiction. Maybe it was alcohol. Maybe it was the bottle that got in the way of your dad from being all there in that relationship. Maybe your mom was so emotionally overwhelmed that she was not emotionally present to help you and guide you through that time. Maybe, maybe her past was riddled with things that, that she, she couldn't give what she didn't have or he couldn't give what he didn't have. These are questions that really help you get some good things talking that are, that are healthy for your family. Maybe it was conflict management. Maybe your mom and dad, they didn't know how to handle conflict. They're just doing what the previous generation did. They didn't know how to sit down and work things through. I always kind of ended up working things out, but, you know, it wasn't very pleasant. You just survived, maybe. You know, you, you wonder why you have such an anger issue, and that's maybe the thing that, well, you saw that's the way that dad handled it. That's the way that mom handled it. Maybe uh, when something happens, you find yourself escaping. It may be because you saw that happen. I, I don't know. But some good questions for you to understand uh, why we do things the way we do things. And then let's make it personal again. Don't think about your parents anymore. Go back for, to yourself. Say, what are, what are two things that keep you from being all there? What are two things? Maybe, hey, you know what? Let's change that to one thing. Can you identify one thing? Just one thing is all I'm asking this morning. Can you identify one thing that is keeping you from being all there in your relationships? And again, your self-assessment might be is accurate. Why don't you ask those around you? What would you say? What, what, what do you see that maybe I don't see? And then ask this question. What effect do you think it's having on our family? What effect do you think that's having on our relationships? Good question. And all of these are, these are great questions for a staff or a leadership team. What is one thing that is in the way of us being connected as a team? If you got courage as a manager of people to lead people through some of these questions, if you got the courage or if you just want to keep, you know, walking around the white elephant in the room and, and not really deal with some things that are keeping you from connecting, man, these are some great questions. So what effect do you think it's having? Uh, I mean, you ask that question. I mean, I've been blown away because we'll have... When our girls come home now, we used to do this all the time when they were in our home, but now when they come home for the holidays, we will have a growth night, guaranteed. I will not let not my kids be home for a week or two and us not have something like this. And I am always the one, I'm the most hungry for it because I believe feedback is the breakfast of champions. I don't want to bury my head in the sand 
And sometimes I still do, and Connie helps me to pluck it up. <laughs> Mike, you're not seeing it. You're not all there right now. You know, so I, I, I got a lot of room to grow, but I'm the most hungry because I see the benefit, the value of what comes out of my girls that, yes, sometimes it's hurtful, but it is so helpful if I learn from it. So what effect is it having? And then uh, let's make it even more practical. What is one practical step that you could take Come on, put your life in the mix that you could take that you, to lay down what is distracting you from being all there. What is one thing? What is one thing? For us, when we have our family dinners, no cell phones. That's one practical step. Absolutely no cell phones. If it lights up or buzzes, don't go to it. Uh, if we have a game night, no cell phones. They already know that. It wasn't easy at first, but we towed the line. And now that's just it's a rule that we have. Even they're adults and they still, you know, we still, you know, do that. And, and that's good. I know for us, FaceTime calls, we love FaceTime because we love to see the girls. They love to see us. But I found myself with a bad habit. I'd be sitting in my chair, my computer or a book on my lap. Connie's over on the couch and she's getting the call from the girls. It's FaceTime. Oh, hi. You know, all that kind of stuff when we're seeing each other. Um, oh, nice bedhead, Mom, you know, uh, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I'll be on the opposite side of the room, and I'll, I'll yell across the room, Hey, girls, it's Dad over here. And Connie, she'll turn the phone so they can see me. And like, Hi, girls. And, and then once in a while in the conversation, I'll be listening, but I'll throw my little two cents in from across the room. And I decided, you know what, that's a bad habit. I need to put the computer off my lap, put the book down, and go get in the picture. So I've left that chair, and I've gone and I've got in that picture so they can see my face. I can see their face. I'm not just shooting one-liners from across the room. I know the girls appreciate that. I know they love to see their dad engaged in the conversation, not just vicariously through their mother. I don't want to be a passive dad the rest of my life. I grew up with that. I want to be active, and I got a long way to, I'm still growing, and I'm still learning, and I'm hungry for it, but I, I reject passivity to my core so I can be engaged. So ask yourself, what is one thing that you could do differently? One practical thing, and in order to get back to the relationship, what relationships are all about, you got to have face-to-face -face interaction. It's got to be eyeball-to-eyeball. I challenge you this week, one day this week, or maybe one evening this week, to have a Facebook fast. Call it what you want. Facebook fast. Just set it down. Social media fast for one night or one day. And, and you tell me what really happened. You know, at first it's kind of hard, but I guarantee you, being all there will make the biggest difference in that relationship. There might be a lot of things you need to do. Why not start with being all all there. Now, if your goal is to wait till you get all the things checked off, cleared out of your inbox, checked off your to-do list before you do any of this stuff, guess what? It's not going to happen. At times, you got to be like Mary who just lets it go undone. You're going to drop everything because of that time that's so important being all there. You know, God invites us to do that as well. He says, be still. Would you just be still? Be still. Quiet yourself. And know that I am God. Mary saw the importance of that relationship with Jesus as the most important thing. What about you? What about me? To be all there with our relationship with Jesus. You know, scrolling on, on social media, trying to find some little sermon bites that will encourage you and lift you for the day. Maybe a worship song or two. Maybe on your way to work, that 10 or 15 minute drive, you got some good stuff pouring into you. Nothing wrong with that, but that does not replace that one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus where we're sitting with his word and we're letting him speak to us. Is it, that, is it important enough for us to do that? To even be all there with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus, who's a friend of sinners, who comes alongside us. Be all there. Do that one thing. Let me go to number two. And I won't take as much time on this one. Number two is be 
intentional. Be all there. Second thing is be intentional. Now this scrap metal, uh, it, it really looks worthless. Uh, it looks like junk and maybe in this state, in this form it is, but I was talking to one of the workers and he said that there is a fortune laying here, that there are millions of dollars uh, worth of, of stuff here. Now, someone who knows what to do with this junk can take this scrap metal through a process that will transform it into something beautiful. Now, believe me, this is a busy place. There are 20 plus people working here, all doing a different job. Some people are taking things apart, sorting things, smashing stuff, things, lifting stuff with these big magnets. I mean, they are being so intentional here. And for a relationship to move from the scrap heap to, to being um, useful and, and uh, beautiful again, it's gonna take a process. It will not happen on its own. Now, like this metal that really is headed for um, the fire, the furnace, so that it can be melted down and all the dross and impurities removed, our relationships have to go through a process. And sometimes God allows us to go through the refiner's fire so that we can become what he wants us to become. You know, he wants to get our character ready to be, ready to be poured into uh, his mold, and that's his word, and that's his ways. Um, so that we could become what we never thought we could become. Romans 12 talks about that. It says that do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't allow yourself to be poured into a culture's mold, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's an intentional transformation process and it is necessary for us as individuals and for our relationships uh, that maybe are broken or fragmented to be made into something beautiful and valuable and useful again. Are you ready for that process? Are you willing? God will help you. He wants to renew our mind. <laughs> it takes intention, it really does. Just having a marriage doesn't make it a great marriage. Just like having children doesn't make you a great parent. You have to be intentional. Sometimes we just set it on autopilot because we're so busy, we're multitasking, you know, we're just thinking, oh, we got this, this smooth running machine, but oftentimes our autopilot is set, is set to self and we're gonna preserve, you know, it's gonna be our way, we're gonna get our needs met and, and be disappointed if our needs are getting met and so sometimes autopilot, we set it on that and that's a selfish thing to do. And sometimes we go through life and we think that if a relationship is really meant to be, that everything should just feel and happen naturally because we're in love. It just should be natural. Man, that just doesn't work. It works on the TV screen, but not in real life because it takes intention. In fact, any relationship is going to go through a number of sta stages, whether it's a romantic relationship, a business relationship. It's going to be first glance. The first glance is, you know, you see all the ways that you're alike, you just, wow, he or she, they seem like a perfect person. You know, he just gets me. Uh, at first look, it's like they have no flaws. Everything is just, just wonderful. And even in business, they, you know, that business partner, they share the same ideals, uh, the same work ethic. They get up early like you do. They like the same kind of coffee. You know, they, they're hard workers. You know, so you share all those things at, at, at first look, but then there's a second look, maybe a reality check. It's when now you don't really see all the things that, the ways that you're alike, you see all the differences and all the ways that, you know, they're just different. Um, and then you begin to wonder, did I marry the right person? I mean, uh, you know, they don't, do they understand me at all? And if the relationship gets stuck right there in all the differences for sure it's gonna be headed to the scrap heap at some point. You have to move on to the stage of called last sight to where the love is growing to where it's better at the end than it ever was at the beginning. There's a growth trajectory in that relationship. And, and now you're being honest about each other's uh, flaws and faults, but you make a decision that we're going to work through it regardless. We're going to be intentional and we're going to take the necessary action required to get us down the road and to get us to grow deeper in our relationship. 
So you really have to be honest with yourself and evaluate the present. You gotta know where you are and you gotta know where the other person is because you may be, uh, you know, an opposites on your perspective. You can be raised in the same family and have totally different perspective than your siblings. That's just a part of life. So you have to know where you are and ask the question so you know where they are. And maybe a good way to evaluate the present is to simply ask this question, what's missing? What's missing in our relationship? What did we used to do that brought so much life and creativity to our relationship? We had so much fun. We talked. We, we were happy. We did this. What's missing? You know? Can you, can you come up with, identify one thing, just one thing this morning that you know has been missing? And if you could identify one thing and focus on that for this week, forget the other stuff, do this one thing that's been missing and I guarantee it'll impact the relationship if you just do that one thing. Like, well, you know, you always used to pray with me every day. You used to pray with me. That's been missing. You used to pray with me every day. If you would just focus on that one thing, it'll make a difference. Or, you know, you used to just pause before you head out the door. You know, once the kids are on the bus, you used to pause for 10 minutes. We'd have a cup of coffee together before you'd go off to work. I miss that. I miss that connection. Can you imagine if you did that, if you did that one thing this week, you paused before you went to work and had that cup of coffee, guess what? You might be late for work. <laughs> In my notes, I got, I got a heart and I got XOXOXO, okay? You might be late. <laughs> Just doing that one thing. I, I know why you're not laughing because you're guilty, all right? All right. <laughs> You, th there is that evaluation of where you're at, where that other person, because you have to ask, you know, what, then you have to envision a future. Let's just jump to that. Envision a future, okay? You got to be able to see where you want the relationship to be. What do we want it to be? Where are we headed? Envision the future. Oftentimes we get stuck in the present problem and we can't see forward. We can't see beyond the, the present mess. And we don't think long enough about where we're going as a couple or in this relationship. And being intentional is about painting a picture. It's about uh, cre uh, having some vision for the relationship. Now, I love this story in 2 Kings, and I'm only going to refer to it for the sake of time this morning. But the children of Israel, they, uh, they had the prophet of Elisha on their, on their side. And King Aram was their enemy, and he was attacking them. But the children of Israel, they always knew what his next move was. And so King Aram is like, there must be a spy in our, in our midst here. And they said, no, it's not a spy. It's the prophet, the man of God, Elisha. He knows your next move. In fact, he knows even what you speak about in your bedroom, the Bible says. So King Aram said, where is this Elisha? And they say, he's in Dothan. So King Aram sends his massive army to, to uh, Dothan. They surround Elisha in Dothan. They, they got a massive army. They surround him. And then look what the servant, how he responds. It says, when the servant, the man of God, Elisha, got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, there were horses, there were chariots everywhere. And so the servant was scared. Oh, sir, what do we do now? The young man cried out to Elisha. And Elisha says, don't worry about it. It's okay. Don't be afraid. We got this because there are more on our side than on theirs. And so Elisha prayed this prayer. And I want to suggest that you pray this prayer over your relationships today, the rest of this week. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Open his eyes. Can you pray that prayer? Lord, open my eyes. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lord, open my family's eyes. Open my spouse's eyes so that we may see. And so the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. This was a supernatural miracle. Uh, just the presence of God's army surrounding the uh, King Aram's army. And they were delivered from that moment. But my point is this. Can you have vision to see with eyes of faith where your relationship could be? Be intentional about it. 
you know, see what the relationship can be. We did this a couple years ago where it was a family project. We had a dream board. I can't tell you how wonderful of a family night this was. And it continues. It's in our home. You come to our home, you'll see our dream board. And we've got spots here for Mike and Connie and Tori and Tiffany and Madison. And a place to list what dream they're really living with personally. What dream they, they, they believe God has given them for their life. And then down here, what a family, some family dreams are. And, and it's so wonderful for me to be able to be reminded, to go over and say, you know, uh, wow, I, I forgot. That's what Tori is really passionate about. That's what she's dreaming about. You know what, honey? I'm going to join you in that, in that prayer for the next couple months. I'm going to believe with you. I would never know if I just allowed myself to get stuck in not being all there and just letting things go, you know, oh, I hope we make it. But being intentional, being all there, being intentional and knowing what we're shooting for. I'm telling you, it makes all the difference in the world. Begin to see your family as you'd want them to be. You know, maybe find another role model of a couple that you could, you know, maybe there's a couple at church, they've been married 50 years, you could say, you know what, they've done something right. Maybe there's something we could learn from them. Take them out to dinner. Surely something you can learn from another couple. Find, if you're not sure, if maybe you didn't have the greatest role model growing up for parents, there's others out there that you can surround yourself with that can help you get out of your funk and your bad habits and develop some good habits. And the last thing is this. Initiate a plan of action. Initiate a plan of action. You gotta do something with it. You gotta say, you know what? We're having a date night. We're having a date night. We got away from that for a little while, but now Monday is our Sabbath. It's our day of rest. Today's more of a work day. We take Monday, and we will always go out for a date lunch, a date dinner. It's every week. And we ask questions like this. We, you know, we wanna lead well. We don't wanna just speak and not live it. So we're always growing, okay? We're taking the time. We're having a date night. You know, when's the la what's the last marriage book you read, men? Or have you ever read one? You want to freak your wife, wife out? <laughs> Bring home a marriage book and say, honey, I really think we should go through this book. <laughs> She'll be like, what? Are you kidding me? She won't know how to take you. But again, it'd probably work out pretty good, all right? But come on, when's the last weekend getaway you had? When's the last marriage conference, marriage retreat you went to? And don't, don't use the excuse, well, you know, you know, and I've heard this so many times, well, we haven't gone out since our kids have been, you know, it's all because it's all about them. Are you a, are you a kid-centered family or a marriage-centered family? That's a decision you have to make. So you have to initiate a plan of attack. And oftentimes for us, you know, we go through stuff as well. And sometimes we have to back off and realize that it's an attack of the devil. We go to John 10, 10 where it says, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so sometimes when we're in the heat of battle dealing with something, we have to step back and say, there's something bigger at play here. You know, it's not really you, honey. It's not really me. Now, there are some things for sure, but I know there's an enemy that wants to destroy us and wants to kill us, wants to take us out because he knows what he gets. He knows the prize. So you got to initiate a plan of attack. And I'm telling you, you do these two things. A lot of things you could do, but you start here with being all there and taking initiative, being intentional. And you will see some changes in your relationship even this week. I want to ask you as we close this service to just maybe bow your heads, close your eyes. Just have a moment with your Heavenly Father. Oh, I know, I know He's dealing with you because He still deals with me. Um, I haven't arrived. I'm still, I still slip back into some of those bad habits of being so 
stressed out on things and not all there and just thinking, well, oh, why do we have to have that conversation? Let's just, let's just brush it under the rug. I'm, I'm like you in that too. So this is good preaching to myself today. But Father, you see our hearts. You see the relationship that we're thinking about. It could be with a spouse. It could be with a son. It could be with a parent. It could be a brother we haven't talked to in 10 years. Whatever that relationship is, God, we surrender that to you. We ask that you give us creativity. I want to ask you today, if, if you would say to me, Pastor Mike, I'm making a new commitment in my relationships. I'm making a new commitment today to be all there and to be intentional. I want you to stand here today. I'm going to make a new commitment. Just stand right now. I'm making a new commitment to be all there and to be intentional. I want to pray for you. I want to bless you in the name of Jesus today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I'm standing there with you because i got a lot of growth yet. I'm not, God's not finished with me yet, but I'm not where I was, and I refuse to stay where I was. I'm going forward, and baby, we're going together. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the honesty, the humility, those who decided to stand here today. Thank you, Father, that they've surrendered their pride. They've been able to see their selfish ways, self-preservation ways, and just sometimes a lack of energy to make the investment in the relationship. God, we acknowledge so many things right now of the reasons why we haven't been all there, what we've allowed to distract us, and why we haven't been intentional. Lord, we lay that at your feet right now. We're not going to use those as excuses anymore because we've heard your word. We've heard, uh, we've seen your example that you gave to Mary and Martha. And we're making a decision to be all there. So Lord, we know great things are in store as we walk in your blessing your favor into the next generation and the generation after this, we know God is going to be blessed. So we surrender this to you. Give us creativity. Give us some wisdom in this relationship. What would be that next step after we are all there? We are intentional. We know you'll help us. You'll be faithful. In Jesus' name.